1 Corinthians chapter 11, and um, last night we, we just kind of laid some groundwork for this topic of the Lord's Supper. And so we saw last night that the word communion in the Bible, it, it's found in three places, and it never refers to any kind of a ceremony that you have in church. So we're, we're not going to misuse that word communion. Uh, we also saw that it's, the Lord's Supper is not properly called the Lord's Table. That's, the, that's also in chapter 10. It talks about the table of the Lord, but that means something else. So we're not going to misuse that term and call it the Lord's Table. Um, but we're going to look at the Lord's Supper tonight. And, and then also last night we looked at a couple of times in the Old Testament when, when we find bread and wine together. And we saw that the first time you see that in the Bible, bread and wine together, it's in the context of the second coming of Christ and establishing his kingdom in Israel. And if you follow that through, you'll see again and again, when you see bread and wine together, it's in that context. So um, with that background that we had last night, tonight we're going to look in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And this is the only place where Paul talks about the Lord's Supper. So we don't have to do a lot of jumping around looking at this verse and that verse because this is the only chapter he talks about it. So let's have a word of prayer and then begin. Father, we thank you again for the, the joy that it is for us to gather together and to, to know that uh, we are safe, we are secure in Christ, and that uh, whatever the circumstances of this life may be and how they go up and down and good and bad, that we don't have to be swayed by any of that, but that we can have a consistent peace, a consistent joy, knowing that we have those eternal glories awaiting us. We thank you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and before we begin reading, again, I, I want to emphasize, and I, I think this is, what I'm going to say in the next couple of minutes is really important that the only place where Paul talks about the Lord's Supper is here in 1 Corinthians. Now that in itself, if you understand a little bit about the book of 1 Corinthians in a general sense, that in itself, I think, tells us a lot. Because the whole book of 1 Corinthians is a book of rebuke. Paul's rebuking him for one thing after another, after another, after another, all through this book. So, if, if we are to observe the Lord's Supper today, and it's just this wonderful blessing that we all should be receiving through observing the Lord's Supper, wouldn't Paul have introduced that, to, taught that to us in, say, Romans or Ephesians? Why would it be the only place he mentions it is in a book of rebuke? And as I pointed out last night, uh, beginning with chapter 7 and verse 1 through the rest of the book, Paul is responding to, to things the Corinthians wrote to him about. So really the only reason he brings it up in this book is because they were having some issues, some problems with it. Um, so we have, we have no evidence whatsoever that any church ever observed the Lord's Supper other than Corinth. Paul never talks about the Lord's Supper being observed in Rome, Ephesus, Philippi, Thessalonica, any other church. Now, I can't prove that they didn't, but nobody can prove they did, because this is the only place he mentions it. And the only church that we know of, for certain, that was practicing the Lord's Supper is a church that was really messed up, the church in Corinth. And so I think all of that, before you even begin reading here, all of that is good to note. All right, so let's begin um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And he begins this topic in verse 17. He says, Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better but for the worse. Now, what, what a way to begin a topic. Now, the, if, if we won't take time to go back and look, but if you go back and read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, for example, in, in many of Paul's epistles when he wrote to different churches, he would say, I thank God 
for your faith, for your love, and so forth. But when he writes to the Corinthians, he thanks God for the grace given to them, but he, he doesn't thank God for really anything that's going on there in Corinth. With one exception, and that's if you look back in chapter 11, and this is actually if you read carefully through the first 10 chapters in this book, and then you come here to chapter 11 and verse 2. This is really startling to read in verse 2. Now I praise you, brethren. Because for 10 chapters, he has certainly done none of that. And so he says, Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. So notice the only time that Paul praises them in 1 Corinthians is because they remember what? They remember Paul in all things. And they keep the ordinances as who? Paul delivered them to you. But now when you come to chapter 11 and verse 17, and he begins this topic of the Lord's Supper, he is not praising them. He says again in verse 17, Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not. So the only time he ever mentions the Lord's Supper in all of his epistles, he begins on a very negative note. I praise you not. And then he says that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. So again, just need to let that, let verse 17 sink in a bit, what Paul is really saying there. And you could, how, I don't know how you could be more negative than he is in verse 17. You know, it would be like if I would say, for example, and this is, of course, not true, but just as an example, if I would say that when you come on Sunday mornings and hear Brian preach, it's not profiting you at all. Well, that'd be a really negative thing to say. But Paul goes beyond that. It would be as if I said, when you come here on Sunday mornings and hear Brian preach, you go away worse than when you came. It's not only that you're not profiting, but it's actually harming you. That's what Paul says here about the church in Corinth. That when you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. So as I said, I don't know how you could make a more negative statement than what he makes in verse 17. And then verse 18, For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. Now, verse 18 is, uh, is kind of interesting because he says, for first of all. Usually when someone says, first of all, you're waiting for, and second, or next, but he never, he never says second or next in the passage. And so there's a lot of question, well, okay, I see what first of all is, but then if there's a first of all, there must be a second, but he never says that. And if I remember, I'll comment on that more later, but just want to point that out now. Um, in verse 18, for first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. So again, very negative as he begins this topic. And then the, the end of verse 18 is a bit of a puzzle to me. If you have this figured out, you can let me know. He says, and I partly believe it. So what does he mean where he says, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it? Well, he, he cannot, you might think, well, he's not sure that there's really divisions among them. That can't be what he means, because if you turn back to chapter 1, and you'll see right in the beginning of the epistle, he makes it clear that there indeed are divisions among them. Chapter 1 and verse 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Is Christ divided? And, and so forth. So right away in chapter 1, he makes it clear that there are divisions in Corinth. So there's no doubt about that. So back in, in chapter 11 and verse 18, what does he mean where, when he says, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it? And, and, and the only thing I can come up with a couple possibilities is that 
when he heard these reports from the church in Corinth, that he thought some of them may have been a bit exaggerated. So he partly believes the reports, but again, he thinks some of them may have been a bit exaggerated. Or the only other possibility I can think of is that he's saying that um, he, he believes the reports that part, part, some of the people in the church are causing division. He, he believes that some of them are. Part, part of the church is causing division. Um, but that's, I'm not going to dwell on, on that any further because that's the best I can come up with. It's still a little bit of a puzzle to me. But anyway, it's clear, again, as he begins, he begins on a very negative note. In verse 17, you come together not for the better but for the worse. Verse 18, there are divisions among you. Verse 19, for there must be also heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So he says, there must be also heresies among you. Now, why would he say that? I, I thought, I would think it'd be good not to have heresy. So why must there be heresy among you? And I think what Paul is saying here, why must there be heresies? Because many of us, most of us, maybe all of us here tonight, have been through, if not personally, at least from a little bit of a distance, we've seen church splits and conflicts and all this kind of thing. I've seen many of them. And uh, as sad as, as they are and as, as unfortunate as it is that that happens, I have seen again and again that when that happens, the cream rises to the top. And you you sort out who is really sticking to the word of God and who is just reacting emotionally. Who is sticking to the doctrine and who is just getting involved in personal issues with people. And it, it, it really sorts out the wheat from the chaff. And, and I believe that's what Paul is saying here, is that in the church in Corinth, there were clearly a number of issues and so Paul's saying there must be heresies among you to sort out, you know, who's going to stand for the truth and who's going to go off into error or emotionalism. Um, turn over to, for a moment to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 17. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. There are a lot of people who like to commend themselves. And in, in every church, you will have people who like to commend themselves. But it's not if you commend yourself, if I commend myself, that doesn't mean anything. It's whom the Lord commendeth. And sometimes heresies, situations like that, seem to be necessary to kind of sort some of that out. Who, who is the Lord approving of and who is it again that's going off in the wrong direction? Um, so back again in uh, chapter 11. And there's something before we move on from verse 19. There's something very important that we need to talk about for a couple minutes. If you read commentaries and Christian books and, and listen to sermons about the Lord's Supper, those who take the viewpoint that we should be practicing the Lord's Supper today, you will see again and again and again, they will take this passage from verse 17 to the end of the chapter, and they will say the issue in this chapter is not one of a doctrinal or theological problem. For example, C.R. Stam in his book on the Lord's Supper. He says the problem in the church in Corinth was not a theological problem or, or a doctrinal problem. It was a problem of character, a problem of conduct. And they will pick out two verses in this whole, from verse 17 to the end of the chapter, they pick out two verses, which we'll talk about in a moment, where you see clearly there's a problem with their conduct when they're, when they're having the Lord's Supper. So there's no doubt about that. I'm not denying that there certainly is a problem with their conduct. But 
there also is a problem with their doctrine. And you'll see consistently that the, the preachers and commentators will brush aside any kind of a doctrinal problem they had and make it all about their conduct. And so one of the things that many of them do is in verse 19, they say that these heresies, he's not talking there about doctrinal error. He's talking about, again, their bad character, wrong conduct. Because they, they want to eliminate any kind of a doctrinal problem that the church in Corinth had. And so, because the bottom line, they, they want to say that Paul is saying that we should observe the Lord's Supper, and the Corinthians should have, and we should, but the way they were doing it was not right. And so when we have the Lord's Supper, we have to be careful, don't do it the way they did it. We have to do it the right way. And so, again, they want to make it all about the conduct and character. So I want to just look at a couple passages, this word heresies. So last night we looked at some words in the Bible, cup, table, bread, communion, and so forth. You have to see in the Bible, how does it define this word? How does it use this word? So, <clears throat> so in the Bible, is heresy wrong doctrine? Or is heresy something to do with conduct or character? Turn to the book of Titus, chapter 3. And, and there, there are not a lot of times in the Bible where we find this word. Um, so it wouldn't take lo long to look at all of them, but uh, we can just look at a couple and that will suffice. Titus chapter 3, and let's begin reading in verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men, but avoid questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. So in verse 10, he, a man that is an heretic. So from this context, what what would we learn about this man that's a heretic? What is it that makes him a heretic? Well, in the previous verse, in verse 9, he talked about foolish questions, genealogies, contentions, strivings about the law. Is that not all concerned with doctrine? Um, maybe he's also a man of bad character. That could be. Maybe, maybe not. But it's all talking about doctrine in verse 9. And then turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. And beginning in verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Well, that very clearly, he's talking here about false teachers. And what do teachers do? They teach. They teach doctrine, either good doctrine or bad doctrine, but they teach doctrine, and they're bringing in damnable heresies. So clearly here, heresy is doctrine. So if you look in an English dictionary, and if you look in the scriptures, even more importantly, clearly heresy has to do with error in doctrine. So now turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And now some of you, if you've not read commentaries and Christian books and heard sermons where they're talking about how we should observe the Lord's Supper, you may not really get the importance of what I'm commenting on with verse 19. But I'll tell you, if you do read those things and listen to those things, over and over and over and over, they will center this whole passage upon the problem in Corinth is how 
they observed the Lord's Supper, the way they did it. And they will dismiss that they had any kind of a doctrinal or theological problem with the Lord's Supper. And, and I'm saying that is not true because they had heresies, and clearly in the context, it's heresies about the Lord's Supper, the wrong doctrine. So in this passage, and this is true really in many areas in, in 1 Corinthians. For example, if you're familiar with chapter 12, 13, 14, he talks about spiritual gifts. They clearly were really messed up regarding spiritual gifts. But when you read those chapters, they're messed up in two areas. One is that there's, they have a lot of doctrinal misunderstanding. And so Paul has to give them the correct doctrine about tongues and prophecy and the gifts. But then they also have a conduct or character issue where they're, they're self-centered and trying to be better than others and all of this kind of thing. So he also has to correct them in that area. The same thing with the Lord's Supper. They have two problems. They do have a character conduct problem, as we're going to see, but they also have a doctrinal problem. And Paul's going to address both of them. So verse 20, he says, When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, again, just pause and look carefully at what it says in verse 20. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. What is the purpose for the saints gathering together? For example, why are we gathered together tonight? Why are we going to gather together tomorrow morning? I don't know how Paul could more clearly say what he says than what he, the way he says it in verse 20. When ye come together therefore into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. That's not the purpose for you coming together into one place. I have, uh, and, and I'm sure a number of you have, number of times talked with people and they find out that we don't believe that water baptism should be practiced in this present dispensation. And I've had people challenge me and say, show me the verse where it says, do not water baptize. Well, of course, there is no verse that says, do not water baptize. The closest that we can come to that, if you turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, this is the closest verse that we can come to, a verse saying, do not water baptize. And it's 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17. He says, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach a gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So Paul says, Christ sent me not to baptize. And then if you, so if they say, show me a verse that says, do not water baptize. And then we show them this verse, for Christ sent me not to baptize, then what do they come back with? You're ignoring the context. Because you have to understand, and we just read this a moment ago, you have to understand in the church in Corinth there are divisions and contentions. And that's why Paul said to this church, Christ sent me not to baptize. You have to keep it in the context of only in this church where there's divisions and contentions. And my response to that is, I understand the context. I've read those verses. I see there are divisions, there are contentions. I get that. But that doesn't change what verse 17 says. Verse 17 still says, for Christ sent me not to baptize. Now, back in chapter 11 and verse 20, if you challenge me, show me a verse that says, do not practice the Lord's Supper. Verse 20. How, how could you state it more plainly? When ye come together, therefore, in one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. And so the comeback is, well, you're taking that out of context. You have to understand what's going on here in the context in Corinth and so on and so forth. And my response, again, is I understand the context, but that doesn't change what verse 20 says. So I think, you know, if you, if you fall asleep right now and don't hear another word I say, if you got verse 20 
I think you'll have a lot to go away with tonight, is just really taking note of what that verse says. Okay, let's carry on verse 21. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. So now Paul is first going to address their, their conduct problem, their character problem. So when they're getting together and having the Lord's Supper, as he says in verse 21, everyone taketh before other his own supper. So they were not being polite, patient, unselfish, waiting for one another, but they were all trying to be the first one. And so one is hungry. Um, clearly there's a divide in this church of rich and poor. And uh, some of the poor don't have enough food to bring and they're leaving hungry, and another is drunken. Some of them are, and people try to interpret this different ways, but it means what it says. They're, they're having bread and wine, and some are drinking too much wine, getting drunk. Verse 21, what? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Now, notice again, you go through verse 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, how negative this is. Everything he said, all the verses that we read tonight, everything is just negative after negative, negative, negative. And that again makes me think, if this is some wonderful ceremony that God has for us to observe in this dispensation, and it's this wonderful blessing, why doesn't Paul have something good to say about it? Why is he so negative about all this? Um, and so in, in verse 22, he is just absolutely exasperated. It's just, it's, he's beyond words. You know, what, what shall I say to you? Yeah, I, I think it's like a, like a parent with a child, and you know, sometimes you... What, what more can I say to you? I don't know what to say. And he's just absolutely exasperated with these Corinthians. Um, and, and he says at the end of verse 22, shall I praise you in this? And see, I think many of the Corinthians would have said yes. Yeah, you, you should be writing an epistle praising us for all the wonderful things about our church. And he says, I praise you not. So clearly in verse 21 and 22, they did have a, a big character conduct problem regarding the Lord's Supper, as they did with the spiritual gifts and a number of other issues that he talks about in this epistle. Now, before we carry on in, in the passage, um, I want to remember to comment on love feasts. Now, that's another thing some of you might think, well, I never heard of that. And if you've never heard of that, that's good. Um, but if you read, again, if you read commentaries and Christian books and hear some sermons uh, about the Lord's Supper, again and again and again, you're going to hear about love feasts. So many commentators and Bible teachers say that the, what the Corinthians were doing was not really the Lord's Supper. It was a love feast. And they will go on and talk about how in the early church, they had these love feasts in the church. And so that's what they're doing here in Corinth, but they're not doing it in the right way. So Paul has to correct them. And so, I, and again, if you've never heard anything about these love feasts, good. And, you know, what I'm going to say in the next couple of minutes may not be highly important or relevant to you, and that's fine. Um, but if you have read those things, or if you do, you will encounter again and again this idea of love feasts. And so I, I want to just take a couple minutes and comment on that. First, Paul never mentions love feasts. You read some of these commentators and they, they talk like, oh, it's just common knowledge. Everybody knows that in Paul's day, all the churches had these love feasts. Well, Paul never mentioned it one time. So if that's so important for us to know about and understand, You'd think Paul would at least one time briefly mention it. He never does. And in fact, if you, if you ask, well, 
And even if you ask me tonight, if you say, well, I've never heard of that. What is a love feast? You can't define it from the word of God because it's not mentioned anywhere in the word of God. So if you say, well, what is a love feast? And what do you do? How do you? I don't know. Not one time is it mentioned in the word of God. Um, now there are people who try to find it in a couple places. Turn to Second Peter chapter 2. And the only verses that anyone ever uses to try to find love, these so-called love feasts in the Bible are outside of Paul's epistles. So that in itself should tell us something. Um, but one passage that they use is 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 13. He says, And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. And so from this, while they feast with you, they come up with this idea that this is this love feast and they have all, and it's nothing to do with that whatsoever. And I, I'm not going to take a long time looking at this verse in the context. It has nothing to do with that. And I think you, you can see that. And then another, the only other one really is in Jude, the book of Jude and verse 12. He says, these are spots in your feasts of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. So that phrase at the beginning of verse 12, feasts of charity, is by far the closest you can come in the Bible to finding love feasts. But again, first of all, this is not talking about the dispensation of grace. It's not talking about the church body of Christ. And it has nothing whatsoever to do with all the imaginary stuff they make up about these love feasts. So turn back to 1 Corinthians 11. And, uh, and, and again, I don't want to dwell more on that, but I just wanted to mention if you encounter this thing, because it's often, as I said, it's written about like, well, we all, you know, anyone who knows anything knows that all these churches in Paul's, Paul's day had these love feasts. No, that, not a word about it in the scriptures. And, and actually, if you go to the secular literature, which of course is a waste of time anyway, but if you do that, they all have different stuff about how, what these love feasts were and how they were conducted. And so it's just absolute nonsense is a point I want to make about all that love feast stuff. Um, one other thing I want to, uh, one other comment I want to make before we move on in 1 Corinthians 11. I pointed out in verse 18, he says, for first of all. So what is first of all? Well, first of all, is when ye come together in a church, I hear that there are to be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. So the first thing that Paul wants to say, first of all, is there are divisions in the church in Corinth and connected with their practice of the Lord's Supper. As I mentioned, there, there isn't any place where he says, and secondly, or next, but I believe there is a second and I believe that's in verse 20. So the first thing is, when you have the Lord's Supper, it's causing division among you. And the second thing is, in verse 20, you're not even supposed to be observing it at all. That's not why you come together. All right, now let's carry on then. Verse 23. So verse 21 and 22 he deals with their conduct, their character problem. Oh, and, and as I said, over and over and over, you will see Bible teachers and commentators will try to make this whole passage about verse 21 and 22. So the whole problem here is not that they were observing the Lord's Supper. Of course, they're supposed to observe the Lord's Supper, but it's how they were doing it. They were not doing it the right way. And so the, the, they make the whole passage about verse 21 and 22. But that's not the end of it. Paul has a great deal more to say. And so in verse 23, he says, 
For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Now, this is a highly important verse on this topic of the Lord's Supper. Because the common teaching about verse 23 is this. They say, Paul is our apostle. He's the apostle of the Gentiles. That's true. And Paul, our apostle, says, I have received of the Lord. Now, you know, it's, it's different if Moses or Peter say, I received of the Lord. That's regarding Israel. But when Paul says, I have received of the Lord, that's us now. I have received of the Lord that which also I, Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, delivered unto you. And so they say, the Lord's Supper, as Paul writes about it here, it's not given only to Israel back in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because Paul clearly states in verse 23, I, Paul, the Apostle of the Gentiles, have received the Lord's Supper of the Lord and delivered it to you. And so if Paul received the Lord's Supper and has delivered it to us, well, then obviously we have to observe the Lord's Supper. But maybe we should read the verse a little more carefully first. In verse 23, Paul says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that you should observe the Lord's Supper. See, I, I have heard that exact statement over and over and over and over. People will say to me, if they find out that I don't observe the Lord's Supper, they'll say, well, Paul says that he received the Lord's Supper. How can you not do that when he says, I received the Lord's Supper? But notice again in verse 23, for I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you. And what did Paul receive? And what did he deliver? That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. There is not this verse or any other verse where Paul says, I have received the Lord's Supper and I'm delivering the Lord's Supper to you. You'll hear people say that over and over, but that is not what is written in the scriptures. Um, and so he, he says what he received is that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Now we immediately know what night that was. We go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We can read much detail about that night. Who was he talking to that night? The 12 apostles given to the, uh, who will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. There are no Gentiles there that night. There are no members of the church body of Christ there that night. Only the 12 apostles to the 12 tribes of Israel. And also notice he says, and Brian and I were talking about this briefly last night. He says that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed. Now why does he throw that phrase in, the night in which he was betrayed? He could have referred to that night in a number of ways. Why does he refer to it in that way? And I'm not going to answer that question now, but as we go along, just keep that in your mind, and as we go along, I think we'll see that, that that's an important phrase to, to take note of and to keep in mind. So Paul, Paul was not there on that night. He was not even saved on that night. So he cannot give a first-hand report of, you know, I was there and this is what Jesus did and this is what he said and so forth. And so Jesus is, uh, Jesus is giving Paul a revelation of what took place that night what Jesus did and said that night. Because again, Paul wasn't there. Now, wh why does he do that? Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And notice in verse 3, Paul uses almost the same exact language. 
Chapter 15, verse 3, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. So here again, Paul says, I received something, and I'm delivering that to you. Now, here in chapter 15, what did Paul receive, and what did he deliver? Did he receive some new doctrine that was not known in previous dispensations? Some new doctrine or practice for the dispensation of grace. Is that what he received here? No, look again in verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Uh, you can read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about how Christ died. And even in the Old Testament that was prophesied. That's not some new thing unknown prior to Paul. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You can Again, you can read well before Paul that Christ was buried, that he rose again. So these are not new doctrines for the dispensation of grace. So why, why is Paul receiving these things in chapter 15? Because the, this whole chapter is about resurrection. Because the Corinthians had doctrinal misunderstanding of the resurrection. Many were denying the resurrection. And so because this was a big problem in the church in Corinth, Christ gave Paul additional information about the resurrection that you could not find anywhere else in the scriptures. So if you continue in verse 5, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. Where in the Bible can you find that when Christ rose from the dead, on one occasion, more than 500 people saw him? Where can you find that in the Bible? Only in this verse. You will not find this in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the book of Acts, nowhere else. So what, what Christ did here in chapter 15, because again, Paul was not there at that time. When Christ rose from the dead, Paul was a, a, a wicked, unsaved man. So he was not here. So because they had a problem with the doctrine of resurrection, God gave a revelation to Paul and he told Paul, this is what happened back there in the past dispensation. When Christ rose from the dead, he was seen of Cephas and James and 500 at once and so forth. And he gives Paul additional information about what happened in the past dispensation. Now back in chapter 11, that's the same thing he's doing here. They have a doctrinal misunderstanding regarding the Lord's Supper. And again, Paul was not there. And so God is giving Paul a revelation about what took place that night in which he was betrayed. And not only does he tell Paul what we can read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but he gives Paul some additional information that you won't find anywhere else in the Bible about what took place that night. So that's what, when in verse 23, that's what that is about, where he says, I, re I received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you. And what did he receive? What did he deliver? Not to observe the Lord's Supper. He received and delivered that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Now, let me ask you, when he says in verse 24, this is my body which is broken for you, who is you? It's the 12 apostles. Who, the night in which he was betrayed, and he spoke these words, that, the only ones there were the 12 apostles. There are no Gentiles, there are no members of the church body of Christ. So if you ask, where in the Bible did 
did Jesus or did Paul tell us, take, eat? You can't find it. It's not, not found anywhere in the Bible. Clearly in verse 24, when he says, take, eat, he's speaking to the 12 apostles, to the 12 tribes of Israel. This is my body which is broken for you, the 12 apostles. This do in remembrance of me. Who is supposed to do this in remembrance of me? It's the 12 apostles. Verse 25, after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Okay, again in verse 25. He says, this do ye. Who is ye? Clearly the 12 apostles. It's what Jesus said that night. As oft as ye drink it. Who is ye? 12 apostles. In remembrance of me. So there's no doubt, verse 23, 24, 25, that this is Jesus speaking to the 12 apostles, to the 12 tribes of Israel. This is not Paul telling us, take, eat, do this in remembrance of me, and so forth. Um, w one other thing I want to comment on in verse 25. Uh, he says, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. And then also in verse 26, for as often as ye eat this bread, and so forth. You know, if you, if you go around and ask all the different churches who observes the Lord's Supper, uh, how often do you do it? Some do it once a year. Some do it once a quarter. Some do it once a month. Some do it once a week. Some do it two times a month. You know, all kinds of different things. And then if you ask them, well, why? Like if they say, well, in our church we do it once a month. They say, well, why? Why do you do it once a month? They will say, well, because in the Bible it says, for as oft as ye drink this. It was for as often as you do this. And so, you know, we can do it as often as we want. The Bible doesn't say we have to do it once a week or once a month or it's up to us. We can do it as often as we want. And I have even talked, believe it or not, I've talked with a couple of preachers and, and uh, I, I asked them if they observed the Lord's Supper. And, oh, yeah. And we, we, you know, I said, well, do you believe that the Lord's Supper is given for us to observe in this? Oh, yes, definitely. And then I said, well, do you do it in your church? And I said, oh, no. I said, well, how, come you, how can you say that we're supposed to do it, but you don't do it? And I said, well, Paul says as oft as you do it. And so we just choose not to do it. Nah, I don't think that's quite what Paul has in mind here. And, and I will, I want to point out, um, and if you don't believe me, when you go home tonight, get out a dictionary and look up the word often. And you'll find the word often means many times, frequently, that the way we use the word often. So, but in many churches, they totally change the meaning of the word oft or often. And they say, well, we can, we can only do it, we, we only have to do it once a quarter. We don't have to do it very often or once a month or something. Because Paul says as often as you do it. But the word often, again, means frequently many times. And, and if this is something that we are supposed to do, and it's this wonderful blessing, wouldn't you want to do it as often as you possibly can do it? If I believe that this is something that's given for us to observe, and, and that it's this wonderful blessing for us, I would ask Brian, can we do it Friday night? And can we do it Saturday night? And can we do it Sunday morning? I want to do it as often as we can then. But they could completely change the meaning of the word often, like it means seldom or rarely. Okay, now um, I just want to go on to verse 26, and then I'll stop for tonight. So verse 26, he says, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. 
Now, this verse 26 is a key verse because in some of you may have or you've seen red letter edition Bibles where they supposedly print all the words that Jesus actually spoke, they print it with red ink. And then every, all the other words in the Bible are in black ink. And so m many passages in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are in red ink because Jesus is speaking, telling parables and so forth. In, in this chapter, they will put verse 24 and 25 in red ink because these are words that Jesus spoke that night in which he was betrayed. But then when you come to verse 26, it's now black ink. This is not what Jesus spoke that night. This is now what Paul is writing to the Corinthians. But let's forget the ink color for a moment, because that's not given by inspiration of God. In verse, clearly again, verse 23, 24, 25, he's talking about that night in which he was betrayed. The 12 apostles are there. And then verse 26, he says, for. Now the word for connects it with what has just been said. It doesn't contrast it, it connects it. For as often as ye eat this bread, who is ye in verse 26? I pointed out verse 24, 25, you 12 apostles, ye 12 apostles. Now you flow right into verse 26 for as often as ye, and they said, no, no, in verse 26, ye is the church of body of Christ. How am I supposed to know that? Uh, unless I believe that the ink color is given by inspiration of God, how, how am I supposed to know that you as the 12 apostles, you as the 12 apostles, ye as the 12 apostles, now all of a sudden ye is a church of body of Christ. I don't think he's talking about the church of body of Christ here. Verse 26, he's, this, he's, this is additional information that you won't find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, just that you won't find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that 500 saw the resurrected Christ. So, so, excuse me, he's continuing in verse 26. This is what Jesus said that night to the 12 apostles. For as often as ye, 12 apostles, eat this bread and drink this cup, ye, 12 apostles, do show the Lord's death till he come. Now, how would they show the Lord's death till he come by observing this Lord's Supper? Well, if you have the Lord's Supper who would you expect would be there? Would you not think the Lord would be there? If it's the Lord's Supper? But he's not there. So when they gather together and they have the Lord's Supper, his absence is conspicuous. And so there by do, and why isn't he there? Because he was crucified. And so when they do that, they're showing the Lord's death till he comes. Um, turn to Matthew 26. Matthew 26 and verse 29. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This is the same kind of thing that Paul just, that we just read Paul uh, quoted in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, That he says, I, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And also look at, so here's the drink. Then look at Luke chapter 22. And you'll see it's the same thing with eating the bread. Luke chapter 22 and verse 16. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So that matches up perfectly with 1 Corinthians 11, 26. A um, couple other comments, and I don't want to go too late and test your patience, but a couple other comments.
Um, if you go back to 1 Corinthians 11, and Paul quotes what Jesus said that night in verse 24, take, eat, this is my body. I, I grew up Roman Catholic, in the Roman Catholic Church, and of course they, they have a doctrine called transubstantiation. And they say that during the Mass, the, the priest holds up this wafer or this host, and it is transformed into the literal body of Christ. And the, and the wine is transformed into the literal blood of Christ. And that's not a figure of speech or something in Roman Catholic doctrine. They believe it literally is the flesh of Christ. And it literally is the blood of Christ. And one of the arguments they give, and I found a lot of non-Catholics, a lot of Protestants, evangelicals, so forth, don't, they get a little befuddled and confused, not sure how to respond when the Roman Catholics say, we believe in taking the Bible literally. Jesus said in verse 24, take, eat, this is my body. So apparently you don't take the Bible literally. We do. We believe the Bible literally means what it says. If Jesus says, this is my body, we take it for what it says. This is my body. Now, there's a lot that could be said about that, but let me make two comments quickly. So, okay, let's say, all right, let's go with that. We need to take it literally. He says, this is my body, then, okay, this is my body. Verse 25, this, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. Does the Roman Catholic Church teach literally that that cup is the New Testament no, they do not. They talk about the bread and the wine, but he doesn't say wine in verse 25. He says this cup. And then he says, This do, you, do ye as oft as ye drink it. Drink what? The cup. He doesn't talk there about wine. So see, the Roman Catholic Church, does, they don't take verse 25 literally in, in the way they define that. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Now, there's a lot of talk and discussion and argument about, you know, do you take the Bible literally? Should, you, should we take the Bible literally? And many times, people like us are mocked because, you know, those people take the Bible literally and so forth. And then they come up with these passages in the Bible that make it look like anyone who would take the Bible literally has to be an absolute fool. Because how can you take this literally? Well, there's something that you should understand. The Bible uses natural language. It doesn't use some kind of weird, freaky, unknown language. It uses natural language. And so... In natural language, like Paul talks in Galatians, he says this is an allegory. So, okay, it's an allegory. It's not to be taken literally in the way that people use that word. So, an example in Revelation chapter 1 and verse, tw verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now, are these candlesticks literally churches? No, a candlestick is not a church. But it says the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Well, if you just take that in the way language is naturally used, it's obvious that he's saying that the seven candlesticks represent or symbolize the seven churches. And we could look at many places in the Bible where he speaks in that way. In fact, if we won't do that, but if you go back to the book of Exodus and read about the Passover, he uses this kind of language there. So when he says back in 1 Corinthians 11, take, eat, this is my body, he clearly is saying, this bread that I'm holding represents my body, symbolizes my body. 
And again, many places the Bible uses, the la uses language such as that. And, and by the way, literal interpretation does not, correctly defined, does not mean that you take everything literally in the way people commonly think. Literal interpretation means that you, again, that you understand every verse, every passage as you would natural language. So when Paul says this is an allegory, I take that literally to be an allegory, and so forth. All right, um, back in 1 Corinthians 11, um, and a couple of comments I want to make quick and then I'll stop. One other thing I want to say about the Lord's Supper tonight is if you, if you are in a church where they practice the Lord's Supper, and I've been in a number of them, Roman Catholic and Protestant churches, there's, when, when they come to that part of the Mass or that part of the service, the whole atmosphere of the place changes. There's this somber, emotional, reverent atmosphere that takes over. And I, you know, that years ago I thought, now why is that? Why is it that through all the singing and praying and preaching and everything, everybody just kind of acted normal? But now when you come to the Lord's Supper, there's this you know, emotional atmosphere that permeates the place. And see, we've got to be careful about that. A lot of people are very, they, they take this topic of the Lord's Supper very emotionally. And they're, they're very emotionally disturbed at the suggestion that maybe this is not something we ought to be doing. Well, we ought not to respond emotionally. We ought to respond according to truth. And so let's get the emotion out of it and just look at the scriptures and see what the scriptures say. Now, one last comment, and then I will indeed stop. In verse 26 again, I'm saying that he's still quoting what Jesus said that night to the 12. And there's a, some of you may have noticed this, so maybe not, but there's a major objection, ob objection, if I can get that word out, to what I said that many would have in verse 26. And that is, so in verse 26, I'm saying Jesus said to the 12 apostles, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Do you see what objection people might raise? He, he says the Lord's death. He doesn't say my death. So if this is Jesus talking to the 12, why didn't he say, you show my death? Why does he say the Lord's death? Okay, turn to Matthew chapter 20. And I'll, we'll look at two verses and I'll be done for tonight. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28 says, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Why didn't Jesus say in verse 28, even as I came not to be ministered unto, but to minister? But he didn't say I. He referred to himself as the Son of Man. And then uh, the last verse for tonight, go to chapter 26 in Matthew. And so now we're actually, this, the verse I'm going to read here is what was said that night in which he was betrayed. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 24. He said, The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Uh, in verse 24, why didn't Jesus say, I go as it is written of me. But he didn't say, I go as it is written of me. He said, the Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. So many, many times when you, you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus speaks of himself in the third person in that manner. So when you read in, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, where he talks about the Lord's death, 
that is not even slightly unusual for Jesus to use that sort of language when speaking of himself. All right, we will stop there for tonight, and tomorrow morning we'll pick it up where we left off. And uh, what, what Paul is doing in this chapter, in verse 21 and 22, he addresses their conduct problem of how they're eating too much and drinking too much and not sharing and so forth. And then the rest of the passage, he's going to correct their doctrinal misunderstanding. And by the time Paul finishes this chapter, there should have been no doubt whatsoever in the minds of the Corinthian saints that the Lord's Supper has to do with the nation of Israel, the second coming of Christ, the establishment of his kingdom on the earth, has no connection with the dispensation of grace and the church of body of Christ. That's, that's where Paul is going in this chapter. Father, we thank you for this time tonight, again, to gather together and look into the scriptures. And I pray that we would not be swayed by religious tradition and that we would not be swayed by emotion, but that we would just take a careful, sober look at the scriptures and believe the things that are written. We thank you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.